what's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. We're already helping to amplify a comic book collection through integrity community. We do a lot of comic and pop culture related content on this channel. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. This is Three Up, Three Down, where we're going to talk about three hot and three cold market trends in the comic community. Real quick, before we get into that, last week we announced on this video that we're going to do a giveaway for this Enhyak Lee Thor variant. And all you had to do was comment on the video, and we have that winner right here, put them in a random list, rolled the dice, randomized the list that amount of times, and whoever came out on top was the winner of this variant. And we want to say congratulations to Frank Lamar Jr. Frank Lamar Jr., congratulations. Email me at simplemanscomics at gmail.com. Give us that mail address and we'll get that out in the mail to you. Also want to congratulate everyone else that commented on here, but stay tuned because we got another great giveaway today, don't we, Jack? That's right. So stay tuned to the end of the video when we are going to tell you how you can get entered into this week's giveaway right here on the three up three down show on the Simplements comics YouTube channel. And one more thing before we get into that three up three down, we have one more great announcement to make, don't we? Yeah, this is something we've been working on for a little while behind the scenes. Uh, you know, and it's one of those things where we listen to you guys, you guys said you wanted uh, shirts, you wanted Simplements comics merchandise and we are aiming to deliver that to you. Right. So we've had some Simple Man shirts before, but we're going away from that. Going with some tried and true friends of ours that own their own screen printing, do their own graphics for us. And we have some shirts available right now at simplemanscomics.com forward slash swag. URLs on the screen. We'll also put the URL in the description of this video. But we have four great designs. We have that Simple Man's Comics logo shirt. We have that AKA Mr. Bolo logo shirt, those two are available in multiple colors, but we have two very special shirts, don't we, Jack? That's right, and we really took a cue from our exclusive Bolo box Simpleman's Comics t-shirt. If you got that shirt around Christmas time, you know what I'm talking about if you saw it on social media. I'm talking about that exclusive Simpleman's Comics Carnage shirt. We took a cue from that. That shirt was limited to only the amount of subscribers we have in the premium Bolo box program. And we want to offer that kind of unique, exclusive collectible in the t-shirt form. So what we're doing is we're releasing two new designs and they are only open for pre-order. And during those, that window, if you can place your order, you will get a shirt. We're not going to be selling these shirts continuously throughout past the pre-order window. And we're going to reveal the first one, which is... DeMeo's favorite wrestling faction, right? Right. Now, we wanted these shirts to really speak to who Brian and I are um, as people, as YouTubers, as, um, as really fans of pop culture. And I, if with my shirt, we're going to the limited edition um, version. We are going to bring together two entities that are absolutely paramount to my fandom. And we're talking about the wrestling faction, the Bullet Club from New Japan Pro Wrestling and Snake Eyes and G.I. Joe with the Bolo Club logo t-shirt. And this was actually inspired by a comment from one of our viewers who said we should do a Bolo Club Bullet Club parody t-shirt. And here you go, from your comment to creation. Right, that's gonna be available in multiple sizes, but this one's only gonna come in black. Same with my favorite shirt that we're gonna have up right now. Everyone knows I'm a big Master of the Universe fan. Everyone knows we like comic books. One of those great Golden Age comics you might may not be aware of is Chamber of Chills. And just like that, we have a He-Man Skeletor homage to Chamber of Chills. All right, so we're combining Brian's love for that vintage horror comic with Masters of the Universe with this awesome homage parody. Really cool. Uh, our, our team behind the scenes did a great job designing these two t-shirts. And again, these guys are only going to be available for a limited amount of time. They are going to be limited edition. So if you get tired of seeing everybody wearing that t-shirt that you bought, whether it was at, uh, you know, Target or Walmart or wherever at the mall, hot topic, you don't have to worry about that. These are going to be limited run and you're, you know, get them before convention season started and show your support for Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Right, and once again, that's available right now at simplemanscomics.com forward slash swag. URL will be in the description. But with that being said, let's get into the three up, three down portion. Starting with the three up, and we are talking about Rogue. Jack, why is Rogue so hot right now? Well, you know, it's really tough to pinpoint an exact reason. I think people are going to point in a lot of different directions. 
Um, comic Book Resources ran an article saying that Rogue should be the villain. If they do it right, Rogue should be the villain in Captain Marvel too. And then kind of went into the history of these two characters. I think a lot of people aren't aware that they have like this rivalry and this kind of, um, you know, it's really kind of a, a anti-hero type battle between them for a while. And it would be compelling and a great way to introduce the X-Men. And then of course, we also have um, TiVo, uh, Tim Vo from Lords of the Long Box, Mikey Sutton, and they, their whole kind of, uh, kind of like movie leaking um, kind of program that they do, whether it's, you know, through the Facebook groups or YouTube, it's gotten momentum. I mean, we talked about it months ago saying, you know, we didn't know what was really behind it. But it really kind of doesn't matter because if you're selling books, it's, I, I look at it a lot like Key Collector, where it's like you may not understand the nuances behind Key Collector, but the reality is when they alert you to a book, the book sells. So as a, as a, as a retailer, you just kind of sit back or a, a reseller, you just kind of sit back and, and use those tools available to you. These days, when Mikey Sutton talks about a book, it's, it, it's popping on the secondary market. And we're seeing that with this book. This was a book that has always been an important book, right? It's always been a low, I say a lower wall book. You know, you, when you're setting up a convention, you always put your, your best books up high, right? Eye level. It's, it's a lower wall book or one of those keys in that Marvel keys box that you've got on the table. But it, it, it's now risen to prominence where we're seeing 50, 60, 75, 100, depending upon grade in that raw condition. And I think it's one of the ugliest covers of all time for a major first appearance. But either way, I get behind it, to be honest with you, whether she shows up in Captain Marvel 2 or not, it doesn't matter. We know yeah, especially it. if you're an X-Men fan, right? And you need to have that first appearance. You do. And it's really for a long time, it's been kind of low compared to several of the, she's a key X-Men. She's very important to that. Yeah, you guys know I'm a Jim Lee X-Men, 90s X-Men. She's so key and paramount to that era and to like Gambit's arc that I think she has to be an important part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe at some point. So this is, this, her book spiking to me is, it, it doesn't really matter why it's spiking. I'm for it because this is a book that we should be buying anytime we see it cheap, even in those mid and low grades, which have often been overlooked. Yeah, this book spiked again a few years ago, especially with some of those X-Men movies coming out. So it kind of goes up, it comes down, but either way, it's one of those books that, if, like I said, if you're an X-Men fan, you want to add to your collection. Me, I bought one a while ago when I was during those X-Men craze, bought it fairly cheap, but either way, I'm not a big X-Men fan, but it's a book I'm happy to have in my collection. Then the next market trend we're talking about on that three up portion this week is Malibu Sun number 13. You've seen this come up, come down, but it always makes its way back around. Why is it hot right now, Jack? It is doing something that I've never seen it do though, Brian. Yes, it has fluctuated. Um, I think the, a bit, the, the desire to collect these types of first appearances has kind of wavered over time right when it first, when people first realized that it spiked up and then you know it kind of went down and then there a new crop of collectors discovered it and it went up and of course there's the error version with the misprint on the back but what makes this book so important to begin with it is it is the first time and i you know what there's been so many new ones found i don't even know if it's actually the first time but it's presumed to be the first time that spawn was shown in print and um so it's a true first if you will of spawn um, I remember a couple of years ago when you would find this book pretty regularly at conventions for about a buck fifty, um, and you know that was a solid buy. I bought mine for a hundred and forty, and it got to a point where I was like, I'm just never going to find it cheaper. And this book is slowly creeping to that like four hundred dollar level. And what's more alarming to me, Brian, is the drying up that I'm seeing on eBay. Um, they, they have really kind of started to dwindle down. It reminds me a lot of Hellboy's first appearance with San Diego Comic Con number two, a book that seemingly was available for a while and is then drying up on the market. These, these pre-first appearances, as I like to call them, they, they, they're really becoming just a part of the hobby. And especially with these characters who are so iconic, um, I'm not surprised by this, but I wonder how high it can get. And I, I look at books like um, some of the old Ninja Turtle stuff, whether and they're not necessarily pre-first appearances, but like Turtle Mania and things like that. Yeah. And they're um, all lower print run books. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just scarce, scarce. 
and, and that's the thing about spawn is there's i think there's a lot of people who like they felt like they completed their spawn collection and they're looking for that next thing and that's that next thing to chase um whether you're looking for rust or you're looking for malibu sun or i think there's a um, comic scene magazine um there's a few different spawn books to chase but malibu sun has become a bit the market leader um and it'll be interesting to see how high can this book really go uh as todd mcfarlane has said that the joker movie and the success the joker movie has seen as both an r-rated movie and a lower budgeted movie has made it easier for him to start getting financial backing for Spawn. So we could be moving closer to a Spawn movie, which could only bring this thing up to the stratosphere. Then the last one we're talking about on the three up portion this week is Spider Woman. This character has gotten a lot of buzz lately, and you're starting to see some of those books go up in price. And this is another one I, I could say it's because Spider Woman number one is coming out. I could say it's because Marvel announced a Spider Woman movie. All right a new spider movie and there's anticipation that it could be spider woman in reality though it's again this mikey sutton this fit kind of facebook leaking group and his reports that that's what it is it's going to be a spider woman um jessica drew driven movie coming to the sony spider verse and that has really piqued interest in this character um now, there's been a lot of talk about the high print run of um, number one. This past week, uh, you know, I've even seen like uh, Comic Tom said, don't buy Spider Woman number one because the, the print run is so high. And there are so many reports of like, you know, people with boxes of Spider Woman number one. But I could say really the same thing about She-Hulk number one um, of about Star Wars number one, all of those late 70s, early 80s number ones, that was at the advent of direct market, of comic shops beginning to open up and ordering quantity of these kinds of books. Um, a lot of these books ended up in warehouses. Uh, so the, yes, there is a quantity, but the book you really want to keep an eye out for is that Marvel Spotlight 32, the first appearance of Spider-Woman which has really always been a kind of a classic key. And it's another one that's where I mentioned that Rogue. It's that low end of the wall, the wall book shelf. Um, Spider-Woman number one is really that secondary book. That's definitely a box book. Uh, it reminds me a lot of, say, like a Moon Knight, where, you know, he has the first appearance in the spotlight, and then you got you to gotta go for that next book. Um, Spider-Woman also has had some variants that have been popped on the secondary market. Of course, we had that whole... Uh, Manara controversy with the uh, the backshot variant, um, but you know she's often been a character that's been secondary, um, especially even within Spider Women. Right, we've seen Silk and uh, Spider Gwen be more popular, but this is a character I think with room to grow, and it'll be interesting to see. Either way, books are changing hands, people are buying. It'll be interesting to see if that continues. I rather I'd vote for Silk over Spider Woman movie, but that's just me. I I think and that, Silk is another one, not on the list, but definitely trending upwards. Um, I think that there is a lot of people very bullish about these Spider Verse characters. Yeah. So there it is. That's the three up portion. We're gonna switch gears right now and go to that downward market trends, and we're starting with DC Second Prince. Yeah, and you know what, Brian. This comes from a one of our kind of group chats um, that we've got, where we kind of were discussing with in, a couple industry professional people who, um, these the second prints and how important second prints have become in the market. For a year, Brian, I've been looking at this camera and going DC Comics, get it together. Yeah. They because yeah they have just missed the mark on second prints. Just give it a different shade. Right. Yeah. So if, so if you're not familiar, what we're talking about here is um, about two, three years ago, we were living in a world where every late print that came out, you just made a slight color change and then stuck it out on the market. We saw Marvel doing that with the trade dress bars at the top and the bottom of the book. They would just change the color for later printings. DC is doing it with the background colors. And DC did it with the background colors. And Marvel figured it out. They knew that people wanted new artwork, but they didn't want to invest the money to go out and pay for new artwork. So they would select panels from within the book that would make good covers. And <laughs> then it was smart because they were cashing in on people that didn't actually read the book and thought it was just a new cover altogether. 
Right. But honestly, even as somebody who does read the book, I don't care because it's made for some unique moments. I think about Avengers 682 with the Mortal Thanos. Hulk coming out of the cave. Yeah, the Thanos, all the stuff with Thanos from Cosmic Ghost Rider through like the, uh, the Fallen One Silver Surfer appearing on the cover. All those awesome covers that Jeff Shaw did. And really, Jeff Shaw is an underrated artist. It allowed that avenue to show off his artwork. DC has never gotten on board this entire time. Think about the classic Keebs brand that we've had um, produced by DC Comics over the last few years that we haven't gotten recolorings. Whether it's the first appearance of any of the Dark Knight's metal characters from um, Batman uh, Who Laughs to any of with a Dawnbreaker, Red Death, doesn't matter. They were all done with that same um, method. Batman 24 with uh, that famous Catwoman cover, uh, the, the, the wedding. They just go to these, these recolored covers and it's the simplest thing for them to do. But honestly, you have to ask yourself, who is your market with that? Your market is simply readers, which is great. Everyone knows on this channel, Brian and I, pro reader, that's what, that's what brought us into comics, right? But as a marketer, you want to attract every kind of customer. And we've talked about this on the channel. There are readers, there are collectors, there are flippers, there are resellers, there are speculators, there are investors. And those are all different segments of collecting. And you want to try to attract Capture all of it. Yeah, all of it. As many of it as you physically can. And that is so possible. All you have to do is to tap into that market. Punchline comes to mind. It makes me think about this and what we're dealing with the punchline and the designer who shows up, of course, in today's Batman 89. Um, I, I think we're gonna see that going forward. Far Sector is another recent release that was extremely popular that got a second print um, where there wasn't anything unique done with it. And then you look at it conversely, what Marvel's done. You look at what Boom's done with unique art and even IDW. Boom, yeah idw and even boom and idw have been smart think about the ranger slayer who we just dropped the back issue bolo when they did the second print they put her on the cover front and center they were marketing exactly why you were buying the book when we had the first appearance of jenica as as a turtle in teenage mutant turtle 95 the second print jenica as a turtle right on the cover market to why people are buying the book DC Comics, step your game up. You can increase your market share with that very simple little change to your marketing kind of program. The, the community is buying these late prints, so it's time to get on board with them. Then moving right along, the next one on the downward trend is that Marvel reader buzz. I think some people are starting to get, I don't want to say burnt out, but they want the story that they want the story. I, I don't know, is it impatience or what? But either way, it's kind of a downward trend. Yeah, I just think it's timing. Um, there's just a lot of titles trending downward. So Venom is trending downward, but I don't, as a reader of the series, I don't necessarily think the quality of the writing has gone down. I just think we got out of Absolute Carnage. Absolute Carnage was this big, successful thing. And there's just going to be that natural drop down coming out of such a large... And then I think also... We didn't get that conclusion, everybody. It did. It Anticipated. Didn't, yeah. You know, I don't want to get too adult after dark type thing, but, you know, when you don't finish, you kind of get frustrated. So uh, I think that's sort of the situation that readers feel. Eventually, we're going to finish. We're going to get to that climax that, that Dylan Brock revealed that everybody wants. And when we do, I think everybody will be satisfied. Immortal Hulk is an example. A little bit different re reasons. People didn't like the storyline. And they just got turned off to the book altogether. So now we're several issues later, and I don't, I don't hear people on a weekly basis clamoring for me to put that book on the bolo list. And then you look at two popular books that were popular for a short period of time, largely due to first appearances, Captain Marvel and uh, Miss Marvel. We're not hearing people talk about those upcoming issues the way we were three or four issues ago. And those were like must include, must read books. And then they haven't had, outside of Absolute Carnage, it's not like they have some big um, tie-in series that everyone's excited about. And I think another problem that they've had is 
their flagship book, Amazing Spider-Man, just hasn't been good. It, they haven't had a single Amazing Spider-Man situation that has really driven people. And then a lot of the offset things like um, the Spider-Man life story, that's over. Um, the Miles Morales stuff has kind of died down. The evil Miles stuff it isn't, isn't doing what it was doing. So we've seen this kind of lull right now. And again, it's why we look at DC Comics because the market's kind of opened up right now with some of this reader buzz dipping for people to start checking out other books. Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, true series fans are always going to pick up the book and read it. And they're going to, I won't say enjoy it, but you know, they're going to stick with it. But I think with a lot of the comic people that are buying them right now, they're not just the readers. Like you've mentioned the, the, the categories of them, the flippers. The, uh, I mean, how many comics hit the shelves each week. So I think there's a short attention span that, that there's a single spot where there's a, a low on the story, they jump off and jump onto something else. Um, either way, I th it's a good point. I think that Marvel reader buzz is definitely down. Mm. Then the last one we're talking about on the three down portion this week is, hurts my heart, but I have to admit it's probably true right now. And that is Knights of the Golden Sun. This is that fantastic story from mad cave studios we talked about a lot on this channel but tension is like we just kind of talked about that attention's gone other places knights of the golden sun you, the buzz for it is down right now wouldn't you say yeah brian i was doing some research on my own on some independent titles and that's what really brought me to this um we know that knights of the golden sun is coming back we we knew that when it ended that, you know, it's immense popularity, Mad Cave Studios wanted to bring it back for another volume. And it's one of those indies that it's in that cycle, man. It's, it's in between, um, it's not being talked about. But it, the reason why we really wanted to talk about it was really because there's some things I noticed. It's not, it's down in, in the aspect of the demand. There is about three sales a month over the last three months of Knights of the Golden Sun books. Having said that, the sales are still quite nice. There was like a uh, CBSI Virgin variant sold for around 50 bucks. There was a, um, a regular CBSI variant that sold for like 20 bucks, a regular cover A that sold for like 20 bucks. Um, the, when you look at the books that are listed, you see the CBSI Virgin, which is out of 100, go for anywhere from uh, you know 40 to 80 listed. Um, and then you see uh, the trade dress version listed anywhere from like 25 up until like 40. And then you see cover A listed at about 20 bucks and you don't see any undercutting and you won't because the whole reason we decided to do a CVSI variant. And if you're not aware, Brian and I were largely behind the decision making process to go ahead and make that variant was because the book had just released and was sold out and people couldn't get their hands on it because this book is only printed with about 2,000 copies of cover A. So that's the thing about this book, Brian, whether it's a new volume of this book coming, if this book gets optioned, the quantity of this book on the market is so small. This is true small press publishing um, that the ability for this book to spike in price is incredible. And I'm actually very impressed in the way that it's retained its value because we see this all the time. Any books going up to 20 bucks and crashing. Here we are a year later, and this book is holding strong at $20 for cover A. That is something that I think a lot of naysayers, when we were talking about this book a year ago, would not have believed. So the demand may be down. It's cold. It, it's, not, it's not something that's on the tip of everybody's tongue. But all we need is something in the market to happen to get people thinking about this book. And this thing could go nuclear because there just isn't that many available on the market. I think you might have just said some of that, saying there's not that many available on the market. A lot of those people stash those away in their collections. That might yeah. be another reason why you're seeing only those couple sales. Either way, I think it's a great story. It's one of my favorite. We've talked about it on this channel before. But like you said, from the market trend perspective, yeah, it's kind of on the down right now. So there it is, guys. That's our three up, three down this week. Comment down below. Let us know. What do you think is up? What do you think is down? We'll feature those comments on this next video. But like we said at the beginning, we have another giveaway this week, don't we, Jack? That's right. And I just talked about Knights of the Golden Sun and the CBSI variant that we had a hand in the production of. And we had our hand in a few variants when 
we were with CDSI and comicbookinvest.com. And today we want to do a giveaway for some of the books that Marin and I had a hand in marketing. Um, we love independent comics here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. We have thoroughly enjoyed highlighting some amazing independent books, uh, creating some unique collectibles for the indie comics market. And it's something that we hope to continue to do under the Simple Men's Comics flagship brand. But today, what we are gonna do is give away three variants. Low print runs, we're talking about, first off, the one you all know, that Dan Mora, um, Folklords number one, Boom Studios variant, numbered out of 500. This will come shipped to you numbered um, from comicbookinvest.com in the My Life Bag. We've got Woven Heart from Mad Cave Studios, the Tomb of Dracula number 10, that first Blade homage cover. Uh, numbered out of 250 with this one. Awesome book by good friend of the channel, Mark London. But yeah, that's an awesome Mauricio Villanueva uh, variant. He did a great job with that homage. And then finally, um, from our friends at Vault Comics, we have this awesome Eternals number one homage, the great Jack Kirby done by Nathan Gooden and Tim S. Daniel. Um, real cool. Another one out of 250. Um, so again, three independent comics. Uh, give you a good taste of indie comics in 2019, some variants that we worked on that we were really proud uh, to have a hand in. And we're gonna give to you for free. And all you have to do is comment on, on this video. What are some indie comics out there that maybe aren't getting love on the secondary market that you think need more attention and people should be paying attention to? Yeah, so comment down below, let us know. We will pick a winner at random, just like we did this week for that Thor variant. Either way, Guys, thank you so much for watching. This is Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics, and we will see you guys in the next video.